All right, guys. Uh, welcome once again. Um, good to see you all back in in class. Uh, yeah. Can I request one of uh, one of you to lead us in prayer? Get started. Yeah. Father, we thank you for bringing us together this morning to attend our class. We want to thank you for the life of our teacher, our pastor. We want to thank you for the life of APC. I want to thank you for everything that you are doing in our lives. Father, I want to exalt your name. We want to humble ourselves, we open our hearts and our minds so that we can Take in whatever we have been taught and let us be a good receiver and later on deliver properly. Father, make us the people you want us to be. We want to thank you for everything you are doing. Bless us, bless our classmates, bless our family. This and every other masses we ask in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Isaac. Thank you for sharing. Uh, all right. Okay, so let's continue. Um, in the last class, we concluded uh, with section three, um, and we spoke about you know correcting uh, um, and also you know uh, encouraging people to have the right conduct, uh, so to speak, right. And as a conclusion of the previous chapter, um, you know, one of the last passages that we looked at was how do we res uh, restore fallen ministers uh, in page one thirty two. Right, and that's what we looked at, and then we looked at um, quite a bit of, uh, 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 you know, how do we confront uh, a lot of misconduct or misbehavior, divisive, uh, you know, individuals, uh, in opposing uh, couple uh, people. Uh, how do we handle? That's what we kind of studied in the whole ch uh, la the chapter in the last week. Um, so, as a conclusion, we saw that. Uh, what do we do in such situations? We see it's best that we don't take it personal. Um, someone else's inability to receive correction is not your fault. Okay, so uh, don't be too hard on yourself, but beat yourself up. And uh, guard your heart by not uh, getting offended right? With, with all these shortcomings and whatever people might have to say or people the way people treat you and whatnot. Uh, it is natural. Uh, a natural response uh, of feeling towards such behavior will be to get offended uh, and whatnot. Right? So I've been there, I'm sure some of us have been there, but uh, it's time and time again just to keep guarding our, uh, our heart and say, okay, you know, uh, how you react after getting offended is uh, very important. So you can choose to forgive or you can choose to move on, right? Or you can choose to retaliate. Um, so guarding your heart is important uh, when when you've been confronted or you're confronting uh, a difficult situation. Uh, giving time for people to change, uh, allow them to move on in peace, uh, uh, not to have uh, the fear of missing out kind of a thing. You know, what, what we discussed is, okay, this, is a, this person is a very good musician in church. Uh, you know, what if I correct and he leaves, uh, he or she leaves the church, I'll be... Uh, one good musician short. Um, that's called the fear of missing out, isn't it? In today's generation, they say FOMO. Uh, but don't be afraid to um, let people go uh, if they want to. Uh, that's fine, right? So those were all the things that we saw, uh, uh, we learned about in the previous chapter. And now today we move on to uh, the different section, chapter 21, uh, Church Order in Gatherings. Um, we, this is a section four uh, to page one thirty four, chapter number twenty one. So we've completed twenty chapters, uh, and uh, I hope you've learned quite a bit, as much as I have learned, uh, just teaching you know, this uh, this course. Okay, so chapter twenty one uh, talks about church order in gatherings. Right, church order and gatherings. So, 
Uh, we're going to discuss quite a bit uh, about administration and how the importance of order and uh, what happens when uh, when there is no order, right? Uh, so, uh, what would you guys have to say? Uh, why would you say that an order is important? Uh, to have an order is important in church. I mean, if I ask that question, everybody I know would say yes, it's important to have order. But uh, why is it important to have an order? Okay. Yeah, God is the God of order. Uh, all right. Uh, what else? For, for the smooth, for the smooth running of the church, because where there is no order, there is disunity, there is disorder, and like uh, John said, order is the first law in the heaven. So. Order is necessary for the smooth running of the church. Right, okay. Yeah. Order is necessary for the smooth running of the church. Yeah, thank you. Isaac, uh, God is God of order. JP said, uh, Jafina says, so there won't be any confusions or chaos. Okay. So when we don't have order, there will be confusions or chaos. Okay, what else, guys? Why do we need to have order? It's like the judge says in the courthouse, isn't it? Order, 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 three times. Order in the court. Okay, uh, what, um, more, what are some of the... Uh, I know the consequences are already mentioned by Jafina. Um, so what happens when you don't have order in the church? Only confusion and chaos. Uh, yes, you know. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Yeah, when you don't have order in the church, the Holy Spirit will not even move because mm. our God is God of order. Uh, Everybody yeah. will be doing what they think is right. So there is, should be an order so that the Holy Spirit can move, so that people also can learn. Thank you. Sir. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for sharing. Yeah. Okay, uh, what else? Uh, have you had any personal experience where you've seen, okay, there is a certain aspect uh, in a particular church where you've seen, okay, that happened because there was no order? Any personal experiences? Not asking you to name any ministries or churches, but then just an example of a personal experience. Okay, I guess all our churches are perfect. All right. <laughs> uh, cool. So, no personal experiences, guys? All right. Okay. Cool. So, uh, well, there seems like there was uh, at least one church that was not perfect, as um, some of us. <laughs> That's the Corinthian church. Uh, so, I mean, they were Corinthian church had a, it was it was a complex church to say the least. Um, right? There were uh, a lot of disorderly manners uh, that was taking place uh, in the Corinthian in the Corinthian church, right, among the believers of. Uh, and, and fellowship and whatnot, and so Paul addresses all of these uh, their issue in a in a, in an epistle, right? So we know the First Corinthians and the Second Corinthians, right? Um, so he goes on to say, First Corinthians chapter eleven verse thirty four. That if anyone is hungry, let him uh, eat at home, lest you come together for judgment. Now, if you remember the context of what we read, this verse in the previous class was in line with what. What was the context? Lord's table. The Lord's table. Yeah. Thank you, Anita. Okay. Someone is alive. All right. So, 
it's, it's a Lord's table, and how they were uh, participating in the Lord's table uh, in a disorderly manner. That means there was no reverence, right? And Paul is addressing that one. That's one issue, and he goes on to say, uh, "And the rest I will set in order when I come." And so he's correcting them in an epistle, saying, "Okay, hey, you've been." doing all of this, it's not right. And there are other things which I will set in order when I come. And then uh, 1 Corinthians 4, 30, 14, 33 goes on to say, for God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, right? And so when you do have order, uh, there is no confusion, right? Like what um, Jeffina has mentioned, so there, there won't be any confusion or chaos, uh, as in all the churches of the saints. Uh, and 1 Corinthians 14, uh, verse 40, says let all things be done decently and in order it's uh it's interesting to see the word decent being used before order and so there's something about being uh you know something about being in order or doing things in order uh, that your decency is kind of shown is or displayed um right um so yeah as most of you have said that god, uh, god is a god of order and uh now, one of the examples that I can think of is even when Jesus had to feed the 4,000, 5,000, I made them sit in the pockets of 50, isn't it? And then only, imagine that. One, the people are all hungry. And when people are very, very hungry, uh, at least if I'm very hungry, I'm also angry. So the last thing I want, uh, the only thing I want is to eat immediately, is not for someone to say, okay, sit in pockets of 50, 50. 50 50 nobody is going to get the food unless all of y'all sit in the pockets of 50 and then they start distributing the bread and the fish and whatnot so uh yeah i mean talk about order and god is a god of order isn't it so um so yeah it is important to say the least uh to have order in our churches to have you know to be organized um it says something about us isn't it and so uh so some of the areas that we strive uh, for excellence uh, for our services and meetings uh, include how can we be in order, right? Uh, is being punctual, that means uh, starting the services uh, on time, uh, good planning uh, for whichever event or church-related or ministry-related event that you are planning. So uh, good coordination, uh, no waste of time. Uh, no unnecessary announcement, uh, cleanliness, efficiency, and similar things. Uh, right, so all of these things. So, And we need to constantly look to how we can improve so that we can serve one another better, right? We can function one another better. Imagine, uh, Im I mean, there are so many other teams which we will learn at, maybe in the next hour, um, at least at APC Central, uh, there are 19 different teams that function together to make one service happen, right? 19 different teams uh, to make one church service happen. So uh, someone can come to church and sit and enjoy the service and go back home, right? Imagine that. Uh, and every every team needs to work in harmony, right? The team itself needs to work in harmony. There, If the setup team doesn't show up, if the sound and setup team doesn't show up, uh, wow, well, yeah, good luck having, <laughs> uh, you know, the streaming uh, team, everything, the media team, the worship team, uh, the pastoral team, the parking team, um, children's church team, all of the so many teams, right, uh, needs to be organized. They need to be punctual. They need to have a plan organized, right, a good coordination, communication, no waste of time or um, or resources, uh, right, so to be so the goal here is to be efficient right and to be uh you know to be uh, orderly okay so uh, we're going to learn some of those things and how we can uh, you know organize be be organized in church and have some sort of an order uh in the church right so uh one of the things is uh, that can kind of create some kind of a confusion uh or even chaos if you want if you want to use that words is um, the use of tongues in corporate gatherings right um, the use of the gift of tongues uh, we all need to use tongues to sing and speak and say hi hello and whatnot uh, but what we're trying to address is the gift of tongues right so um, and you'll be you'll, you'll be amazed uh, how 
there can be a certain uh, so many pockets of people in the charismatic uh, churches that some believe in the gift of tongues and speaking in the gift of tongues and some don't some don't feel the need to uh, uh, you know and <laughs> there were a few and uh, there are a few in uh, among my circle as well so john you and i've had this conversation so it's pretty interesting so um we need to set things right isn't it uh, especially about this topic so uh, can we use tongues uh, in corporate settings um okay so the famous passage that we uh, often use is first corinthians chapter 14. okay so what does it have to say a um, those who do not understand what we are doing b when giving a message in tongues okay uh, the main concern is one is those who do not understand what we are doing right and the second thing is when we when we uh, in giving a message in tongues um, and so it is in that context right if there is no one who can interpret a message in tongues then let them keep silent is what paul is writing in first corinthians chapter 14. now i want you to remember those two words keep silent okay can you do that for me remember those two words keep silent all right it's important so um paul is using that in the context where you're giving a public message a message to and the entire corporate body the congregation itself and if you're going to if there is a if you are delivering a message uh, from god uh, right if you're inspired to do that and if there is no interpretation then nobody is being encouraged or empowered so it's better to keep silent and release the word when there is an interpreter okay um but then it goes on to say so we can all speak in tongues in a corporate setting just follow along me with me in the notes right so we can all speak in tongues in a corporate setting so long as we fulfill what is required of the proper use of tongues in public setting it is perfectly fine for individual believers to speak in tongues between themselves and god in a corporate setting right in the corporate setting uh you know let's say for example if the worship leader uh encourages or says you know hey uh all the pastor says all right for the next two minutes or five minutes let's all just lift up our voices and pray uh in the spirit it's a corporate setting right so we it's absolutely fine so it's we are praying together or as well as an individual if you are inspired to just pray in, in the gift of tongues uh release uh, uh, or pray or sing in tongues uh, you, it's absolutely fine right and so the only we need to understand the context where paul is saying to be silent is then if you're giving a public message to the entire congregation if you're speaking in tongues and nobody's unable to understand um, then he says keep silent it's better to uh, release that word when you have an interpreter right um, and another setting where it's okay to speak uh, in the gift of tongues is if we are in a setting where everyone knows what speaking in tongues is where everyone knows okay okay gift of, you know we are pentecostals or charismatics or what what is it radicals or, or if you're part of any denomination that uh, you know, that understands uh, what the, what is speaking in tongues is then it's again perfectly fine for everyone to speak in tongues um loudly as well right since uh, what since everybody knows what we are doing it's not like it's it's not like you start praying in tongues and you start getting these strange looks it's like okay what's happening now um right so all right are you guys with me a any a any thoughts uh that you all have on this Okay, so uh, so I think it's it's very important to uh, address uh, about the gift of tongues and talk about it. And make sure that your congregation, uh, you know, knows that you believe in this, and 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 being able to teach. Everything flows from teaching, isn't it? There is a revelation in teaching, and so 
uh, making sure that your congregation is being taught on the, on the subject of the tongues is very important and talking about all of this it clears the confusion it, it clears the miscommunication or or the perception that every individual uh, have about the gift of tongues and and you and by doing so you are also creating a culture saying okay this is who we are there's an identity that is being released uh, right when when you speak about such subjects openly right and uh, we've seen that uh, as you mentioned that our god is a god of order and not chaos uh, we see that in john chapter 3 verse 8 uh, he also says that the wind blows where it wishes and you hear the sound of it but cannot tell uh, where it comes from and where it goes so is everyone who's born of the spirit and Psalm 115 verse 3, but our God is in heaven, he does whatever he pleases. Um, so the scriptures there are also to say that while we are pursuing order, right, while we are pursuing uh, to be organized, uh, we must never forget uh, to let God have all the control, to invite him, to let him do what he does best in everything that we do, corporately or individually as well right uh, if at any time in whatever we are doing we feel that that god is directing us in ways we uh you know when which you have not planned for which is not in your schedule as a ministry or as part of the plan uh, and if you feel strong very strongly led by the holy spirit uh it's always beautiful uh to obey and be sensitive and follow the leading of the holy spirit right um there can be many times. I mean, so again, I please forgive me if I keep taking the example of uh, the All People's Church because that's where, as a church, I attend, I, I work. Uh, you know, so we, what is uh, we we use this uh, words right for a service is what is the order of service, right? Uh, Every every serve, every church service has an order, isn't it? So we use those words, uh, you know, when we are planning for a service. Okay, this is the order of service, uh, and we've been doing this for two decades, and so now everybody is aware. Okay, we start with worship for forty-five minutes, and then we have communion, and then we have announcements, and then we have the pastor coming and doing the declaration, and then we go into the word, and then we have ministry time, and then we disperse. Right. So there is an order of service. But, but we are familiar with and now that we have that order and uh you know what happens when there's a worship lead uh, a team is leading worship and uh, uh pastor comes on the stage and he senses that god is doing something different he's moving so because pastor is sensitive to what the holy spirit is doing and saying to him uh he would want to have an extended time of worship right uh, sometimes uh the entire service can be uh, of only worship where it's happened a couple of times, right? So, uh, and that's what it is about you, you know, you have the order, but then you let God be God. Okay, um, you guys with me? So, uh, I'm not sure how many of you know Jeremy Riddle. Riddle uh, for he, he was a worship leader at Bethel. He leads at, he leads at Vineyard, Jeremy Riddle. Uh, he says, uh, this is he's addressing the worship team. He says, "Prepare like it depends on you, and lead like it depends on God." Right? I say that again. Prepare like it depends on you. Okay. So um, <laughs> it, it, I, I've I've seen uh, some of the worship leaders, uh, you know, before. Um, surely not from APC, but. <laughs> uh, you know, say, okay, you know, let's just do spontaneous worship. Let's just go prophetic worship. Uh, and uh, I'm not going to plan any songs. Uh, I'm just going to flow and whatnot. Uh, so there's no plan at all kind of a thing. You know, it's, I mean, if that's the case, every time you lead worship, uh, everybody is going to be nervous and uh, nobody's going to want to follow. Right. But, and that's why that quote is so beautiful when he says, you prepare like it depends on you. Like, I'm going to sit, I'm going to make the set list, right? I'm going to be sensitive to what songs to be chosen, uh, you know, sung. So you're preparing like it depends on you. And when you start leading worship, uh, you're leading like it depends on God. Now, Lord, you're on the driver's seat. You take uh, wherever you want to go. 
and we will follow. Uh, you know, so that's the importance of uh, being in order and also being able to be sensitive and to follow the Holy Spirit, leading of the Holy Spirit. Right. Uh, another thing that can cause confusion and chaos when there is no order is uh, that people can manufacture uh, the manifestations of the Holy Spirit. Right. Uh, some. Some people may engage in attempting to imitate the work of the Spirit through their own fleshly zeal. Uh, I know you all of you understand what I'm saying. Right? <laughs> uh, is this real? Oh, is that you know? You know? You know what I'm saying, right? Uh, <laughs> well, uh, guys, that's where as leaders, as ministers, it's super important for us to be uh, has to have that. Uh, intimate and a deep relationship with the Holy Spirit, with God, and for us to be able to discern if that is of the Holy Spirit or not. It, that that is key for us. Otherwise, there is absolutely no way we can know, that, isn't it? Uh, it's very important for us as ministers, as leaders, uh, for us to uh, be uh, to have that very intimate relationship with the Lord, and that you know Him so much that anything which is not of Him, and you are easily able to identify. Okay, hey, I know my God. Uh, you know, that's that, that seems a little off. Hey, it is possible, right? Uh, I mean, nobody is perfect. Uh, you know, people. It, it can happen, and so if a certain individuals are incorrectly, you know, like motivated uh, manufacturing uh, you know with with an intention through the flesh rather than the spirit um, it is important that we deal with them in private okay uh, you you take them into your room or meet them after the service or have a call with them and say hey about that word you gave in church I <laughs> want about that thing that happened um, uh, what was that about? Uh, what was going on? Right? Uh, deal with the motives of the heart. Okay. Uh, it's important to do this in private as well because uh, you know if you're releasing one of the things that we encourage uh, when it comes to uh, moving in the prophetic or flowing in the prophetic is that that gift gets better and better as you are willing to take risk. Right. Um, so the intent. It, it all boils down to the intention and the motives of the heart. Uh, you know, a person's heart might be absolutely genuine and authentic and 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 clean when they're releasing a prophetic word or a gift of, or a word of knowledge, and it might be incorrect or whatnot. But it's okay. We are encouraging them. We are giving space for mistakes. That is different from another person whose intention. And motto of the heart is only to show off, right? Uh, and so that uh, is very different, right? And um, so uh, it, it again comes down to us as leaders and how we handle the situation, how sensitive you are to the leading of the Holy Spirit. Okay, right? Uh, are you guys with me? Any thoughts and any questions so far? Now, uh, now there's only a couple of things that's been mentioned in this chapter, right? Um, that that requires uh, order and whatnot. Now, again, the list is endless. Uh, you can, uh, you know, have a custom-made list for your own church, for your congregation um, that you feel there are certain there are certain areas that needs to come um, and you know have a certain order, and so you can add to it and address that. Right, uh, any other thoughts, guys? Any a, anything that you want that you want to share? Okay, all right. Um, so let's move on to the next chapter, chapter twenty-two. Uh, Women in ministry. Okay, should women be in ministry? Yes, no, maybe.
okay well, that's the end of this chapter let's move on to the next chapter <laughs> okay yeah we have our answer guys uh, you know <laughs> it's it's a little uh, hilarious that we need to even discuss about this thing but you know let's let's do it uh, because uh, uh, you know for the sake of it now let's see uh, what we can learn from this chapter okay women in ministry um, I, I mean how many examples do we need of women <laughs> mentioned in the Bible right uh, okay so chapter 22 page 137 uh, there are multiple mentions of uh, women uh, in the Bible um, See, we have Miriam, uh, sister of Moses, uh, who leads worship with the tambourine in her hands, and all other women, uh, you know, who follow her and with 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 tambourine and dances, and they sang to the Lord. Right? Verse twenty one it says, uh, "Answer them, sing to the Lord, for He has triumphed gloriously." There's a worship leader there, right there. A woman worship leader, um, the horse and its rider, he has thrown into the sea. Right there, declaring that's it's awesome. So Miriam, and we know Deborah. Uh, Deborah is one of my favorite judges <clears throat> from the book of Judges. There were um, how many judges were there? Sixteen judges in total. I always get that number wrong. Fifteen or sixteen? I'm not sure. Anybody help me out? Okay, or, or <laughs> I might be incredibly wrong but uh, okay but yeah debbie was uh debbie is really one of my favorite uh judges deborah <laughs> right uh now deborah a prophetess the wife of lapido uh was judging israel at that time and when she would sit under the palm tree of uh of deborah between rama and bethel in the mountains of ephraim and the children of israel came up to her for judgment Right, uh, so a judge, uh, in other words, were it's not just a person who gave judgments. Okay, uh, it was someone who uh, it was a word used for as a leader or or as a, a savior, so to speak. That's the root meaning of the word judge. Okay, so uh, I mean, all those years and days, they would look up to Moses and Joshua, and uh, you know Gideon and whatnot. And then you have uh, Deborah, and where people of Israel are looking up to for guidance, for wisdom, uh, for you know to say, hey, okay, what can we do next? What are we supposed to do? So there's Deborah, there's uh, Hulda, uh, who was the prophetess, uh, right? She was the wife of Shalom. Uh, and there's also mention of Isaiah's wife, who was also a prophetess, but there's no mention of her extensively. Uh, of her name is just mentioned very, very, very briefly uh, in Isaiah chapter eight, verse one and three. Um, and Esther. Um, some some of them have even have debates saying why do we need to have the book of Esther in the Bible when there is no mention of God, and all of that. I was like, yeah, okay, we can have those conversations endlessly. <laughs> but Esther was uh, was, a, was an amazing, you know, uh, was such a powerful. She had all the characteristics of a leader, of a warrior, of an intercessor, uh, right? Um, so who prayed for the deliverance of her people? Um, so Esther, Anna, um, Anna was more again of uh, an intercessor, uh, you know. Uh, she was more of living a life of fasting and she also taught in the temple the, the scripture says right you can read all about it in luke um philip's daughter in acts chapter 21 8 and 9 so and, and the list goes on really guys uh you know it, it's not just i mean there's so many mentions uh in which we will look at some more uh, names of a few more people uh right, we talk we see that paul talks about uh priscilla who is the wife of Aquila, right? In Romans uh, chapter 16, uh, talks about Junia uh, in, again, same chapter, Romans 16. Um, I mean, there's quite a few mentions of the name, right? And he also mentions a couple in Philippians, uh, Uodia. Uodia is, it's, it's a tricky name, guys. Okay. And again, so this is just to give a few examples of. Uh, women who are mentioned in the scriptures um right so it, and so which leads us to the next question 
uh, can women be uh, a minister uh, for which you have all answered uh, you know unanimously uh, very energetically <laughs> but, uh, yes uh, and again to minister simply means to serve right and somehow we've complicated that it's like to minister means oh this is position there's this there's that <laughs> Can women minister? Or it simply means what you're asking is, uh, can they serve? And absolutely, isn't it? Um, right. So we see that uh, the the grace to serve has been given equally to man and woman. Right. Uh, there is equality in the grace that is given to both genders. Right. In Galatians chapter three, verse twenty-eight. It says, "There is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus." Right. Uh, it it should appear that that should be enough, and for us to move on in life. <laughs> uh, but no, we need to talk about it more. Um, right. Uh, there's this passage, right, in Matthew chapter 4, verse 4, uh, it, it says, um, man shall not live by bread alone. And the word, the Greek word man that's used there is anthropos, which is gender neutral. That means it is can be for both male and female, right? Um, and uh, I guess uh, one of the, um, what is I saying? One of the tools that I have mentioned quite a bit uh, that I would encourage you to use it for your Bible study and whatnot is eSword, right? Uh, if if you are using a Windows uh, system, it's a free download. Um, if you are using a Mac, I'm sorry, you have to pay. Uh, uh, but you have to pay, okay? <laughs> uh, and so it, there you get to download uh, different versions, translations of the Bible. And you also get the the Greek, what I would uh, speak NT and interlinear um, version, and also Hebrew interlinear is there. So what it does is uh, above below the Greek words, the English translations are also there. So you know uh, you can see the words that is used. So it's very important for your personal growth, Bible study, and whatnot. So um, okay, so coming back to this topic. Uh, so the Greek word used there is anthropos, which is gender neutral. For it's for both male and female, man and woman, um, right? And Second Timothy chapter two verse two. See what it says. And the things that you have heard from me, among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men, who will be able to teach others also. Now again, this scripture has been. Uh, Manipulated or misused or misinterpreted, uh, saying, "Okay, commit these two faithful men." Only men is mentioned there, so women are not there. So let's, they are not supposed to be in ministry. So don't uh, equip them, don't train them, and whatnot. Right? Once again, coming back to the Greek word, the the Greek word used there for men is the plural of anthropos, which is anthropos. Okay, uh, it simply means a human being. Okay, it's a plural word for anthropos, which means a human being, uh, male or female, doesn't matter. So the Greek word for man is aner, A-N-E-R. That is not the word that is used there. Okay, which is uh, completely or totally masculine, as it says, right? So uh, the gender neutral word anthropos is used in Second Timothy chapter two, verse two. So, guys, we are just building. Um, uh, a case right now that women can be in ministry. Okay, so that is our argument. Is absolutely yes. Um, Ephesians chapter four, verse eight and eleven. He says he gave gifts to men. It's the, once again, it's the same Greek word, right? Uh, and he gave some. Uh, it could be he or she, gender neutral. The same word that is being used there. Okay, so when God poured out His Spirit uh, in in the, on the day of Pentecost, it was for men and women, right? Male and female. It was not just for men, right? Um, he poured out his spirit for all of us. When he died for us on the cross, he did, just didn't die for men, 
uh, he just didn't die for man to experience his love or his or just didn't die for man to experience his grace the forgiveness was not on just for man um you know it was for everyone and we just saw that in in galatians that there is no jew nor gentile nor slave nor free no male nor female man nor woman everyone is one in christ jesus right and that is the beauty of uh the premise of this entire um argument isn't it uh is that we are all one and his grace is same for everyone right uh, in the new testament also we observe uh, equality for both men and women in the receiving of spiritual uh, power and grace and spirit and exercise of spiritual gifts and ministry offices so uh, in ex in ephesians we see right there are five offices uh, pastors teachers uh, the uh, evangelists uh, apostles right and those offices are not just for men women can also function in those offices right uh, we saw in a couple of uh, examples in the beginning of this chapter uh, where hulda was a prophetess right? isaiah's wife was a prophetess okay so that that means you they can also function in the offices of one of the five offices that's mentioned in the book of ephesians um, as mentioned, you know, Paul talks about Priscilla, uh, Junior, and Phoebe, um, who are all leaders in their own right uh, in the early church. Okay, so uh, we've kind of established that, um, yes, women can be in ministry. Okay. Um, <laughs> okay, uh, the next uh, topic is the, the section that talks about is women in leadership. Okay, uh, can I request uh, someone to read Romans chapter 12, verse 4 to 8, as mentioned in the notes, please? Romans chapter 12, verse 4 to 8. For as we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function, so we being many are one body in Christ and individually members of one another, Having them gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. If prophecy, let us prophecy in proportion to our faith. Or ministry, let us use it in our ministry. He who teaches in teaching, he who exhorts in exhortation, he who gives with liberty, with liberty, he who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Jafina. Right. So uh, again, to reiterate the same uh, statement that's, uh, that we've made before is that the gift of leadership has also been given to both men and women, just as there's grace that's been uh, showered upon both men and women for ministry. Even the gift of leadership is uh, poured over us and everybody is expected to function, um, you know, in that role. <clears throat> right. And so and there are so many examples, uh, isn't it, in our own lifetime that we see whom God has used, uh, like Catherine Kuhlman, uh, Amy Semple, uh, McPherson, uh, who was an evangelist, uh, Maria Woodworth, Etta, uh, Joyce Meyer, et cetera, et cetera, uh, and so many other generals of God who are women uh, in, our, in our lifetime uh, who've gone on to do uh, such beautiful and, and, and great things, right? Uh, I mean, guys, um, just to say the least, uh, you know, I was born in a Pentecostal family, right? Um, there was always this sound of prayer and singing in my own family, uh, right? And one of the most beautiful sounds, uh, uh, you know, that I will never forget is the sound of my grandma praying uh, in the morning, every morning at 4 a.m. faithfully as a kid. Uh, she doesn't live with us anymore. She, uh, but then at the time when she used to, uh, every morning faithfully at 4 a.m., her, her sound of prayer was the sweetest sound I've ever heard. Uh, you know, that it made me sleep even more peacefully uh, for some strange reason. And uh, I would miss her sound, her voice of prayer. And so, uh, I mean, thank God for women in our lives, isn't it? Um, right? So, yeah, I mean, are this, uh, should they be, if, should women be in leadership? Absolutely. Yes. Okay. The next section talks about the same thing, the head and the headship. Um, so we come to the bottom of page 140. Um, okay. Remember, I asked you to remember those two words, keep silent. 
right? Um, <laughs> so, First Corinthians 14, 34, 35. Can someone read that, please? First Corinthians chapter 14, 34, 35. Let your women keep silent in the churches, for they are not permitted to speak, but they are to be submissive, as the law also says. And if they want to learn something, let them ask them. It's shameful for women to speak in church. Okay, yeah, thanks, Jeffrey. Okay, so we've discussed quite a bit about that, and we now we come and read this passage, and we are like, whoa, whoa, okay, all right. And um, so... It's a perfect scripture why they should not be in leadership, why women should not speak in church, isn't it? And that's what it it can look like when we take that verse out of context and just take a look at, uh, at, that, at that text for its face value. But uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, that entire chapter, uh, it's this, from the same chapter where we read these two verses, 34-35. Paul uses those words, keep silent, three times. Right, uh, and so now it's sort of all of a sudden it makes sense. It's like, oh, okay. And so uh, let's look at those situations. Okay, different situations that Paul uses. One is in between First Corinthians fourteen, verse twenty-seven to twenty-eight. He says, "Speak in tongues to the church audience. If there is someone who will uh, also flow uh, in interpretation, else keep silent." Right. That's the first time. The second time is uh, verse 29 and 30, immediately after. Take turns to prophesy. When you have delivered your prophecy, then keep silent. So, I mean, just because he said keep silent in the first part, when he talks about speaking in tongues, do we say, you know, thou shalt not speak in tongues ever, even if you're a Pentecostal? I mean, imagine saying that to a Pentecostal. <laughs> He'll be like, what is the meaning of my life after that? <laughs> right, isn't it? Um, what do you mean I can't speak in tongues? I'm a Pentecostal. There's no other meaning in my life if I can't speak in tongues. You know, it's, it's like that. And imagine we don't just because uh, you know Paul says keep silent uh, after giving a word of prophecy. That doesn't mean you don't release a word of prophecy again, ever again. Right? Like it's all coming down to the context, isn't it? Uh, and. And it's the same way there is uh, women if you have questions uh, keep silent um, Just ask your husband at home later and then that is the context here Right, and so the whole point uh, the objective in that whole chapter or the context is order Okay, not the stopping of the exercise of a spiritual gift or leadership Right, so we as it says in the notes, we do not use the keep silent injunction to prevent speaking in tongues or prophecy. So why should we prevent women from preaching in church using the same injunction? It doesn't make sense, isn't it? Right? That's not fair. That's just manipulating, uh, misusing, uh, whatever you want to use. So uh, we can't use that verse, that verse, uh, First Corinthians, uh, out of context and and stop women from. Uh, you know, speaking in church, and that's that's not it. Okay, uh, and the next section talks about I do not permit a woman to teach. Um, and this is another famous passage from First Timothy chapter two, verse eleven to fifteen. Right, and um, this is the remember this is the epistle or the letter that Paul is writing to Timothy, while Timothy, who is right now pastoring the church in. Ephesus, which is the church of Ephesians. Okay, and then he says, let a woman learn in silence with all submission. And I do not permit a woman to teach or to have authority over a man, but to be in silence. For Adam was formed first and then Eve and then Adam was not deceived, but woman being deceived fell into transgression. Nevertheless, she will be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith, love and holiness with self-control. Okay, now again, as we've always learned that if you just take the text without the context, uh, is, you're going to misunderstand it, isn't it? And uh, this is where also uh, studying the Bible comes into play, studying uh, the letters, who's the audience, who's writing to whom, 
and what is the cultural background uh, of that audience of that region what was happening at that time what was which date you know which year was it written and then you go and just a little, dig a little deeper say okay what was happening uh, during in Ephesians uh, the church of Ephesus during that period uh, and when you dig a little deeper you'll uh, you know as it mentions in the book called I suffer not a woman which is written by Richard and Catherine Clark uh, it was during that period where there was a cultic worship practice had, had kept uh, crept into the first uh, century church where they would worship uh, involving a female priestess of Diana Diana was a Greek goddess right so Diana was a Greek goddess and the pri uh, priestess of this god uh, would uh, you know there were a lot of malpractice uh, cultic worship practices teachings of uh, you know uh, sexual immorality and whatnot and and saying that okay you know the women are superior or you should need to have superiority over men and all of that so that is the context all right so what paul is saying to the ephesians was i do not allow a woman to teach these cultic heresies nor do i allow them to use authority from men by performing pagan rituals that's what paul is saying i'm not going to allow them to teach about all these things or perform pagan rituals right that's what he's saying what he was not saying like we've misunderstood is that i do not allow godly christian women to teach the bible that is not what paul is saying isn't it and so now that we have this context this background of why okay what's happening now it makes sense okay so he is trying to protect the congregation, his flock, from uh, you know all these false practices, uh, false doctrines, and it's not not even doctrine; it's just cultic, isn't it, in its nature? Um, and so, and that's the basis of Paul's uh, argument or what he's saying to Timothy. And that again, that scripture has been taken out of context and misunderstood, misinterpreted, and whatnot. Uh, but as a conclusion, we must recognize that God has always used and continues to use women uh, in different ways uh, for the purposes of his kingdom, right? Uh, he continues, is, continues to use that. And, uh, and uh, any healthy church should encourage uh, women to excel, um, you know, still more in what they've been um, uh, described in scripture as, you know, they're, they're already doing so. A, 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 any healthy church should be doing that right um and i uh, realize that we've gone uh five minutes over time um so we'll pause here and we'll take a 10 minutes break we'll come back at, uh, in 10 minutes all right and we'll uh, go into the next section all right thanks guys see you <laughs>